Hey, real quick, this isn't paid, but The Velocipaster 2 is currently on Kickstarter. The Velocipaster is one of my favorite movies I've ever covered on this channel. I've grown to be very good friends with the original director who is still involved in this project, and I would love to see it get funded, so I'll have the link down below. The literary sensation, the birth, the film sensation that is sweeped the nation's kind of not really is finally ready to be laid to rest. As promised, I'm here with the finale of the 365 Days book trilogy. This book does so much more than the movie. If you remember my video about the movie, it ends with a pretty large cliffhanger of whether or not she's gonna pick Nacho or Massimo, and it seems like they were leaving it open for another installment. And I can't tell if they're actually gonna do that or if they just wanted to make sure that no one would get mad at them for making a hard decision on which mob boss. But the book is very different in its conclusion, which we will get to, so uh, feel free to check out my video on the second book if you kind of want to get fully up to speed because there is so much that happens in that book that doesn't happen in the movie. But first, the reason why I was even able to get through this story lickety split today's sponsor, Audible. As you all know, because I'll never stop talking about it, Audible is the best place for audiobooks and spoken word entertainment. They offer thousands of different titles from new releases to memoirs, classics, podcasts, the book talk infamous, and all the depraved titles that I subject myself to. So no matter what your preference, Audible will have the perfect piece of entertainment for you. I really rely on them for these videos because I cheat code my way through the stories at three times speed, but I also love using it at a more leisurely pace for things I actually enjoy. I'm currently going through I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy, which is a doozy. Every month you get a credit to use on any title, including new releases that you get to keep for life. You'll also get access to the Audible Plus catalog, which gives members unlimited access to select audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, sleep tracks, and more at no additional cost. That means free! So if you're looking for new ways to be inspired or entertained inside while the weather outside gets a little bit chilly, make sure to head on over to audible.com slash Jedi or text Jedi to 500, 500 to get 30 days completely free. Now just to give you the basic rundown of where we left off, it is pretty similar to the movie. Laura ends up shot, but the circumstances were very different. It has nothing to do with the twin brother they randomly pop up uh, you know the movie cleans that up quite a bit it ends up being the guy that tries to grab Laura at the club and then Massimo pulls guns on him, but he'd actually shot holes in his hands. So that guy basically just orchestrates this entire thing for a rival mob family to kidnap Laura so he can beat the shit out of her. Which leads to the shootout, but in the book, she's pregnant and it ends with them being like, I don't think we can save the baby. And that's where we left off, but this book ends up jumping like basically to the end of the book's story, which was a choice. She's driving a new car she got as a gift. She's happy, excited, meeting up with her man to get a final present. She's been getting a different gift every single day leading up to her 30th birthday. And when she gets there, it's not Massimo giving the gifts, it's Nacho. Team Nacho, baby! I might still make the shirts. I think I've missed the wave. And the final gift is proposing to her, which literally guarantees that she's not with Massimo by the end of this book. So like, why would you spoil that? Like obviously people are gonna read it to like figure out the descent of how we got there, but it kind of pulls the tension out of a lot of the situations. Also just because people are consistently confused on the timeline and why different titles didn't happen, uh, Massimo kidnapped her on her 29th birthday. That means that this book ends a year after that happens, which means that all of this bullshit and the bullshit yet to come has all happened in under a year. So the title isn't about this being the next 365 days after the first 365 days, it's basically like, hey, this book ends after those first 365 days. But we gotta figure out how we got here, so it cuts back to her in the hospital, working through all of her surgeries, barely keeping her alive, and then her ultimately realizing that she lost the baby. Which, as tragic and horrendous as that is, I feel like anything that prevents her from being DNA linked to this man is probably a positive. But she recovers, he takes her back to the compound, and uh, things aren't really great from the get-go. He's just instantly harassing her to find out what happened when Nacho kidnapped her. And on the one hand, he's not wrong to question it. She is super into Nacho. They did kiss. It's just his method of inquiry that's the problem. And like the movie, she ends up waking up in the night and he's just all like, coked up drinking in a chair, loses it at her when she's not giving clear enough answers and smashes the glass, which just like in the movie, she starts thinking about how he left her like abandoned there where when that happened with Nacho, he like delicately carried her to safety. 
which makes her realize that she might not be ready to go back to this happy life with her husband. This is when Massimo essentially starts to ignore her and for once in this damn story, someone suggests therapy. Olga forces Laura to talk to a therapist. It will amount to literally nothing. I do not know why they wasted the page space. Though I do love that when Laura tried to leave, Olga points out that they can find a therapist on their own or Massimo will find one that will report back to him. Super healthy. Obviously, the real therapy that Olga wants is partying, which they will obviously do, but not after a makeover and quick fuck sesh while Massimo's having a meeting. And as always, I just love the artistic language here. His cock was ready. He whipped it out and impaled me. I felt it tearing through my insides. You know, horror novels and smut have a lot in common with their descriptive writing. Also, if you're gonna call me out on having the book when I just said that I used Audible, that is because I will read along while listening at at least 3.2 times speed so that I don't miss anything that I'm hearing, but I can read faster than I would be able to if it was just my eyes. It's an entire system and I felt like I needed at least one of these books physically for the culture. But they head out for their day of food and partying. Laura fills in Olga about what happened with Nacho and she realizes that Laura probably seems to be in love with him and obviously he's still into her too. Manages to call her. Apparently he's been watching her from afar. Somehow still not as bad as Massimo though. And like in the movie, they make it to the club where Massimo shows up, but this plays out a lot different than in the movie where it just feels like more of their like typical weird dynamic. It is a very angry encounter in the book. He's pissed that she left the mansion without his permission because again, she's essentially a prisoner. And because he's pissed, he's right back into doing coke. Pulls out an entire platter of it, which pisses her off. So to express her displeasure, she just rips a line herself, which is when he tells her that she's disrespecting her new heart. She doesn't question it in the moment, but it's revealed that she had a heart transplant that no one told her about. I call bullshit. Total bullshit. The doctors would have had to run her through like so much stuff. She'd be on all sorts of different medications with specific instructions to make sure that nothing happened to it. This is foolish. And because he's just so respectful of her heart, uh, when she continues being pissed off at him and tries to leave, he starts to choke her and then really pushes to know what happened when she was kidnapped. And when she won't give him the answer he's looking for, he unleashes this absolute romance. You'll dance for me and then you'll blow me. After I come in your mouth, I'll you. I'm upset! Now this is after he has choke slammed her into a private room and instead of being more afraid or pissed, she just says that the coke is making her feel more in love. So she goes along with it. Ma'am, that was coke, not ecstasy. So this just leads to an hour long brutal f sesh apparently. And then when he's done, he just stands up coldly and is all like, time to leave. Because he's still super mad at her. And then it plays out pretty similar to the movie. He starts ignoring her for weeks on end. She starts throwing her all into building her new fashion brand. And it all kind of comes to a head when she's rushing to catch a plane for work and he just heads her off to essentially use her as a sex toy. He was like a man possessed. There was no love or affection in his intense glare. Massimo decided I was ready. He rolled me over and impaled me with his cock. And at first she's okay with it because she just feels like they're kind of like reconnecting, but then he just leaves the second he's done, which obviously upsets her. So when they get invited to a fashion show in Portugal, she just jumps at the chance to get away and have some fun with Olga and build her brand. And like in the movie, when she and Olga get to the beach, Nacho is there in a surf competition, except this time he actually sees her, which just makes her think, just when my life had begun to look normal. Ma'am, you were at the beach to drink and talk about how fucked up your relationship is. You just told your best friend that he ignores you until he wants to hate fuck you. Honestly, maybe that's normal for these two. However much therapy she's getting is not enough. Now, Nacho also definitely has some issues. For one, he's the hitman for his mob family and he now runs that mob family because his dad died in the last book. And we're literally only introduced to him because he kidnapped her. And another issue is that he really just apparently likes to like break into places. So like she ends up wasted. And when she stumbles back into her room, she thinks she's hallucinating him, but he's like actually there in the room. He doesn't do anything, just helps her to bed and then leaves, but you know, concerning. So they head to the fashion show, like in the movie, Olga gets way too drunk and starts making passes saying she's gonna sleep with the bartender. So Laura makes sure she gets sent back to the hotel. And once her security detail is gone, Nacho's sister comes to talk to her and obviously Nacho is there too. And this is where he reveals that apparently he's the one that tracked her down 
her new hearts. Uh, no word on whether or not he killed someone to get it, but that's so nice of him. Now in the movie, they actually smash when they get back to his place. In the book, they just dry hump to completion. She's edging all you sickos. And when she heads back to her hotel, Massimo is obviously waiting for her because she ditched her security detail. And he is way more brutal in the book than he is in the movie. It starts bad, but descends into horrific. So if you're someone who's sensitive to assault, I'm not gonna go into like great detail, but it, I just really need to express how gross it is. I'm gonna have a, something you can click in the description so you can just jump ahead to that. So he's pissed that she disappeared, thinks she's lying, which she is, but he's being super unreasonable in his behavior and she starts going at him for essentially abandoning her after she lost their child. So eventually he snaps and says, if you think you can leave me, you're gravely mistaken. Then rips her shirt open and bites her nipple. What the fuck? Then it just 100% dissolves into our word. She tries to stop it, refuses to do anything, and his response to that is, come on, baby girl, I'll do what I want anyway. Like he pinches her nose until she opens her mouth and it just gets worse and worse. Like he has her tied up. It's so fucked up. I won't go into more detail, but I was horrified. And we're only like 100 pages in of a near 400 at this point. Then he just wakes up the next day being all cute with her and he's shocked that she's mad. Massimo's officially outside the bounds of what therapy can help. He just needs to go to super jail. But he finally realizes what he did after she shows him all the bruises. He tries to say that he'll stop drinking and drugging, but she firmly says that she needs to go to Poland for space or the relationship will die. And if he tries to show up or control her while she's there, she'll file for a divorce. Which is when he gives the expected and super reasonable response of, you won't leave me, I won't allow it. So even though she should leave him, especially after he said something like that, she maintains that she won't. She just needs some time away and that he needs to quit everything, get into therapy and go back to how he was being a year ago or she's done. Keep in mind that a year ago and not even a full year ago at this point is when he kidnapped her. I can't with this woman. She starts to think about her future and what she should do and then has the thought that even if she does leave Massimo and considers being with Nacho, he could still end up being a monster too. But her thought process here is really what gets me? What if Nacho turns out to be a monster too? I used to think my husband wasn't one, but his behavior the previous night had left me without faith or hope. Ma'am, he kidnapped you without your will and manhandled you every chance he got. Like I know Nacho also kidnapped her, but it was for mob business, which is still bad, but at least it wasn't I'm kidnapping you till you fall in love with me. He's also shocked that she's afraid of him now and gets pissed that she's pissed that they did it against her will. Jesus, I've done it about a hundred times again your will. That's where the fun comes from. Wee woo, wee woo, officer. Interpol? Yeah, this this whole situation. Then he starts going off about how she says no, but then begs for more, but at least she holds strong and asks him how many times she'd asked him to keep going last night. Boom, sick fuck. So she heads to Poland and unusually similar to the after part four book, uh, to prove he trusts her, he doesn't send one of his men. He hires Damien, her MMA fighter ex-boyfriend to drive her around and keep an eye out. <laughs> Literally just another person that's very recently made to move on her and Massimo broke his leg for doing so. It's so messy, besties. Now he just gets to chill wanting her back while giving her relationship advice. <laughs> Honestly, I'm just bummed that, spoiler alert, the random guy that pretended to be gay to make a move on her in the last book doesn't reappear here. It's like, what a random freaking detour plot line that was. But she tells her mom all about Nacho and her feelings about Massimo without going into full detail, obviously. And her mom just basically gives her like the I told you so. And then kind of forces Laura to acknowledge that even she thinks she's basically just wasting time waiting for Massimo to be perfect before she'll eventually realize she's stuck. Yet still, she questions what she should do. So she heads to clear her mind on a motorcycle ride with her dad, but then Nacho shows up. She had told him that that she was going to Poland to get space, but he doesn't care about that. He makes a great impression on Laura's dad. He knows about bikes, speaks decent Polish, and convinces Laura to go back to where he's staying, where he specifies that he won't sleep with her until she's his. So again, they just dry hump their way to completion, but then they shower together naked with some very 
loose respect boundaries going on here. But this is when I was subjected to her describing his ween as the straightest and most beautiful cock <laughs> she had ever seen. And now you're being subjected to that description too, suckers. But we're getting all this information about her time with Nacho while she's thinking about it on the plane right back to Massimo. Very risky business, ma'am. So she lands and he takes her to the house he bought her specifically to get away from him and surprises her with a dog, which he just ends up using as a manipulation tool, saying that the dog is completely dependent on him just like he is and if she doesn't care for it it'll die just like he would specifically saying he'll die without her get out of any relationship where someone says that to you i didn't think he could get any worse but like she seems good with it thinks that this is him making a genuine effort to change for one she shouldn't be anywhere near him after what happened and honestly you know like we're not nacho deserves better than her because she just gets right back into it with massimo says that her defender and love of her life is back. You just can't fix this, you know? Maybe the answer for Laura is non-monogamous relationships, which obviously would not fly with rival mob families, but it's, it's a suggestion. But he's actually trying to be playful and she's feeling good, but it's so out of character for him that she ends up slipping and calls him Nacho. Oh no. So he pouts off. She thinks it's going to be okay, but then she wakes up to him watching her naked in the night, drinking and probably on some drugs, accusing her of sleeping with Nacho. Which technically she didn't, but it really wouldn't matter in this moment either way. Again, I'm not saying that anything she's done is correct. It's his reactions that are So he doesn't want to listen to anything she has to say before threatening to rip her ass into with his Ah, could I, did you hear any of that? I had to bleep most of it. Thankfully, she manages to escape to the car with her dog. She calls Domenico to say Massimo was gonna do it to her again. So he plans her escape where he and Olga are in Ibiza. But when she says she's gonna get a divorce, he has the audacity to say that she can't do that to Massimo. Are you kidding me, sir? She at least maintains that she can't go back to him saying that there's nothing he could do to keep her around as his dumpster. The new smartest thing she's done and said. And Olga is honestly just as dumb as I expect. When Laura tells her what happened, she says that she doesn't understand how you can be assaulted by someone you're with. And just in case you were also under that belief, yes, you can be assaulted by your partner even if you're married to them. Don't let that shit fly. But of course, as they're out partying, Nacho shows up and introduces himself to Olga. This man just truly does not give a shit. And yes, he is absolutely just stalking her all around Europe. But this leads to Laura concocting a plan, a stupid plan to get Nacho drunk to see if he turns into an unhinged monster. So she tries to piss him off by saying she slept with Massimo when she got back from Poland, that it was great that Nacho is nothing to her, but it just makes him sad. So I guess he passes. She ended up recording on his phone that she was like lying and baiting for most of this. Like he is sad that she had sex with him, but now he's mad that Massimo had apparently tried to hurt her in some way and definitely wants to kill him, but won't tragically. So she ends up calling Olga while he's out swimming away his frustrations. And of course, Massimo had already shown up in Ibiza and tore a place the part when he realized that Laura wasn't there. And it seems like he might be planning some kind of hit on Nacho. So Laura insists on speaking to him where she says she wants a divorce. And of course, he again says some very normal, totally well-adjusted things. I'll find you and take you back to Sicily and you'll never leave again. So she basically says she'll meet up with him somewhere in public. And that's about the end of that. But Nacho overhears her talking about the divorce is obviously super stoked and I guess that's good enough to be considered single and they do it. And he is making promises to her with every thrust. Like this man just cannot be chill. But then he gets even less chill when she says she's not exactly ready to just jump into a new relationship yet, which makes sense. The divorce hasn't even been started yet. But he takes it super personal. Like she wants to be with him. She doesn't want to be away from him, but know that it's possibly not the healthiest thing just to immediately jump into a new commitments. I can understand being disappointed, but then he just immediately starts acting like Massimo, asking if she'll only fall in love with him if he becomes terrifying, and then just starts... I'm just dancing so many lines. She starts, you know, his fat mm, impaled me and took my wits away. Why are you ruining Nacho? He was maintaining such a firm lead. He still is, but 
This ain't great. But she's into it. He basically pleasures her into agreeing to be his girl and then makes sure he gets the same answer when they're done. So that's something, I guess. Ooh. So now they need to come up with some kind of safety plan for her to meet up with Massimo and, and officially say she wants the divorce. Not entirely sure why she needs to see him in person for this when he has threatened to kidnap her, but sure. Nacho being a hitman, mob boss, empire leader, sets up on a roof with a sniper rifle, has a bunch of his men come covering every angle, and a cell phone ready to lay down the law with Massimo. So Massimo shows up, obviously doesn't want to take any of this seriously, and basically just tells her he'll never let her leave. That she belongs to him, that he can't imagine anyone else using her, and that he enjoys effing her too much. Really just laying that charm on thick. But the second he tries to grab her when she maintains the divorce, Nacho shoots his glass off the table. They've mentioned that the restaurant is essentially empty right now, but you gotta assume that that would have caused some kind of panic, but sure. So Nacho calls, Laura puts him on speaker, and he lays down the law. And Massimo had just assumed that she had hired a generic hitman, but when he finds out it's Nacho, damn. Why wasn't this in the movie? This is so entertaining. Oh right, they would have actually had to commit to making Massimo a complete monster. So she leaves once Massimo realizes he's surrounded, make it back to Nacho's beach house he had brought to her originally, and then they just get to have fun. And I'm back on Team Nacho because he's dancing around to Cry Me a River by Justin Timberlake. Cry me, cry me. No wait, that music video was wild. It's the one where he pretends to break into Britney Spears' place after they broke up. Anyway, for whatever reason, immediately after this harrowing experience, they have to go to a party his sister Amelia is throwing. But it's fine, she loves seeing Nacho in this setting. He's so light and fun, but she misses Olga, so he just casually tells her to invite her around for as long as she wants to come down, and they'll just clear it with Domenico. And she is just so happy about this completely normal reaction and suggestion. Then we get what I have to consider to be a fourth wall breaking moment for the smut category. Nacho mentions Fifty Shades of Grey and calls out the rich, controlling, sex-addicted asshole definitely alluding to Massimo. But Massimo is way worse than Christian Grey, and this story was born out of the Fifty Shades franchise per the author's statements. Either way, this was just a buildup for him playing Love Me Like You Do on violin. You know, the Fifty Shades song? which is just super party appropriate. She's super into it, they sneak off to Smash, but then he pushes her into going into like full detail of what Massimo did, even though I'm pretty sure she made it very clear before. So now he wants to kill Massimo again. I, I feel like we already went through this, but then they just go down to this like sub-basement area to shoot their frustrations away, which I can get on board with. But who thought it was gonna be smooth sailing from here? Oh no. The next morning she gets a package with her dog cut up inside it. He got her one of those tiny little puff balls. How could you kill that? I was literally just thinking about how she left the dog behind and this psycho leaves a note that says you did the same to me. What a fucking nut. So now we have to let Nacho kill him, right? Like let's make that little shitty note reality. But apparently not. She just calls Olga to let her and Domenico know what Massimo did and begs him to let Olga come visit, which he does. Obviously it takes a little bit of planning because you know, rival mob family. But when she shows up, she again starts making these like weird arguments that Massimo used to be nice or kind or fun. And then Laura maintaining that everything was perfect until New Year's. That is literally everything that happened up until Nacho nabbing her. It was absolutely not perfect. It was never perfect. He was also never fun. This is nonsensical. The only negative thing she says is that Massimo is controlling and took all the decisions out of her hand, like having the baby, by lying about saying he gave her a birth control implant when it was actually a tracker. You know, just like quirky little romantic things. And then it's time for Olga wedding where Laura is the maid of honor and Massimo is supposed to be the best man but he's been like missing on some kind of bender but obviously he shows up. It's dumb that she even went even with protections Nacho's men can only infiltrate the area so much because it's like rival territory. And this dumbass is still like tantalized by him even though he just murdered your dog and mailed it to you. Go have a cold shower. You are not down this bad. You are getting it on the regular. Ah. And she's jealous that he showed up with another woman which was obviously part of the plan. Show up clean and sober. Tell her you'll give her the divorce. Make her jealous and try to get her drunk. So instead of being whisked away to a plane immediately after the ceremony which is what should have happened, they go to the reception 
scene where Olga tells Laura that she can't have it both ways. She can't be with Nacho and be jealous of Massimo moving on, which is a very fair point, but we should be backing this up with he assaulted you multiple times, tried to do it again, and murdered your dog. And for some reason, when he requests a discussion with her, she agrees, but then she mentions the dog, and he says he didn't kill it. How could she think he had that in him? And I am positive that this is just an elaborate plan to set up Nacho. He says he sent the dog to her alive because she'd be forced to think of him. Then has one of his men confirm that he just delivered the dog alive. But ma'am, why would you believe what one of his own employees said? If Massimo killed the dog, do you really not think his employee would be under the instruction to lie? You can't fix this. So she starts drinking, which is the number one thing she was told she was not allowed to do for her safety. So Nacho calls and she accuses him of killing the dog, doesn't bother listening to anything he has to say. And just like that, Massimo has complete control of her, the situation, and Nacho's men are forced to leave. Ma'am, he literally said he was going to lock you away forever so you couldn't escape again. All it took was him talking to her calmly for one conversation. This is madness. But she wakes up the next morning Morning, very shocked as to where she is and doesn't remember what they did the night before. So she goes to shower where she's contemplating like who she should pick as if like you have that choice anymore, which becomes very clear when she opens the drawer to grab some shoes and sees the boots that belonged in the box he sent the dog in because he sent it in a designer box. So the jig is up. He ties her to the bed and basically says he's just going to keep her in a comatose state and get her pregnant. Like this man's escalation, I cannot even begin to put it into words. Like we went from heightened Christian gray to sick fuck from don't breathe. But one day after doctor complicit drugging, she wakes up feeling alert. And it's because Massimo wants her to have dinner with him and says that he'll let her go if she gives him one last night of enthusiastic sex. Says he'll send the men away and he's got divorce papers ready and waiting to go. Now I think it's absurd that they sent him completely over the edge for her not to want to be near him. Why did it literally have to escalate to tied up incubator to send the message? Why? can't he just be the same he's been the entire series and her realize that that behavior was never okay. But she agrees to his terms and that it has to be done in an area of his choice, so his office library. Now my immediate thought was that he had a series of cameras and recording devices set up in there and then he would send the tapes to Nacho of her enthusiastically being with him to make sure he stayed away. And my thoughts went there because that's exactly what happened in the last book with Olga's ex and Domenico. Just so much happens. But he says it's because he realized in therapy that she's not his salvation, but he just wants one more night of being desired. Sure, I definitely believe he de-escalated that quickly. But whatever, she tries it, but gets like 20 seconds in and just can't, so he gets pissed and sends her to a room where conveniently, Nacho is waiting. So he gives Lara a gun and they start making their way out. Obviously, Massimo catches her, says she'll never shoot him and never escape, but then Nacho emerges from the darkness. But for some fucking reason, Laura won't shoot him and won't let Nacho do it either. So to make it out, she just bashes him with the butt of the gun, which I did enjoy, but this is a man who strapped you to a bed, drugged you while trying to turn you into a baby incubator. And you know he'll never be arrested, at least not for this because he owns this city. Like I think murder is the viable option here. So she starts running, but ends up caught by Mario, who is Massimo's consigliere. But even he knows Massimo's gone too far and just lets them go. But of course the drama can't end that easily. Laura realizes she's pregnant, assumes that it has to be Massimo. It's a whole big stressful thing. But when she goes to take care of it realizes that the timeline means that the baby is actually nachos so yay for that except that is an exceedingly fast timeline and now she is stuck with at least one mob family forever at least I, at least i like this one and then in some weird way fair to his word on her 30th birthday exactly a year after he kidnapped her massimo sends the divorce papers it's just like he said if she didn't love him after one year he'd let her go they even try to make him seem kind of reasonable with it he like makes sure she gets her fair share of money from the divorce lets her transfer away the company from anything connected to him and she can keep it like, i'm sorry we're just like supposed to forget all of the things he just did. Okay. It then cuts back to that opening chapter and of course she agrees to marry Nacho. So they have the baby, they're super happy, and Massimo's just like adjacently there as Olga's kid's uncle. 
But hey, other than being loosely linked to her like abuser, kidnapper, ex-husband for the rest of her life, she's got everything she wanted and all the people she loves close by. Yay! But that's the book. It is a much more concrete ending than the movie, which I appreciate, but my God, she went overboard with Massimo's behavior. He was already firmly the bad guy. We didn't need to do all this. And it leaves us off with an author's note that at first made me think like, hey, maybe she actually gets it. But then I read the whole thing instead of just like honing in on the one line that I agreed with, which was Laura is stupid. Cause then I started thinking about how far she had to push things with Massimo, how like outlier that behavior was. And the way she describes some of Laura's thought process, it's just, it's no. The note basically says that the trilogy doesn't exist to glorify Stockholm syndrome or his actions. The Massimo is imperfect and Laura is stupid. No shit. But is that really the takeaway? Not to romanticize money and a glamorous life and a charming man. She says Massimo is charming, like where? And then leaves us with the fact that independence, space, and partnership count. Yeah, no shit. I'm sorry, man, but this book did not teach me that lesson. Like, I don't know what you thought you did, but it wasn't that. Maybe it could have been that if you hadn't literally turned him into like a horror movie villain, but by having to escalate him to that level before she stays away from him, it just sets like a, a very weird message about all the actions that happened before that. But yeah, that's the book. As usual, it's a lot. But thankfully, this one at least felt like it was all working in service of one mission instead of the last one, which just hopscotched around so many plot points that amounted to nothing. I got whiplash. But let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. This one was a lot. Um, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a nap. But thank you all so much for watching and to Audible for sponsoring the video. Thanks as always to my Patreon and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All of my social medias are listed down below if you wanna follow me over there. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm, I'm actually mostly okay. And we'll catch you all later.